Hi everyone, this is your host, Greg. Today's featured playwright, Charlotte Meehan, has an event coming up called The Audacity, Women Speak, from March 28th to April 6th at the Boston Center for the Arts. The show highlights real stories of women's experience with harassment, sexism, and rape. See sleepingweasel.com for more information. Our co-host this episode is Kate Snodgrass of Boston Playwrights Theatre, which has one more show coming up this season, Dead House by Beirut Baludis, April 18th through 28th, about a high school community plunged into shock following the death of a beloved varsity football player. Boston Podcast Players is supported by a grant from the Bob Jolly Charitable Trust. Boston Podcast Players. The story thus far. Cast of characters. Characters. Empress of Rome. An entity or demon. A run-of-the-mill Polish guy in his 40s. Setting. In a small hut. A long-forgotten era that lives both in the past. Act one. We create the the world with the stories we tell about ourselves. Because Stephen, he could be anywhere, right? Don't give up the ship! Cannon fire. Bianca pushes the stop button. The end. Welcome everyone to Boston Podcast Players, Boston's virtual podcast stage for new works by local playwrights. I'm Greg Lamb, the host of the show, and today I'm joined by today's very special co-host, the one and only Grand Empress of the Boston Theater Marathon and Boston Playwrights Theater, Kate Snodgrass. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hey, Kate. Hi. Anyone familiar at all with the Boston theater scene probably knows who you are, but for anyone who doesn't, uh, would you like to introduce what you do? Say who I am? Sure. I'm a professor here at Boston University, and I run the graduate program in playwriting in the English department, and we collaborate with the School of Theater. We produce new work all the time, and this building and surrounds only see playwrights. I also am co-founder of the Boston Theater Marathon, which is an annual event using 50 10-minute plays in 10 hours. Uh, Each one is supported by a different theater company in the New England area. And each one's a new play by a a local playwright. Yep, a 10-minute play. So we do 21st tradition. 21st, we are now legal. Thank you. And Boston Playwrights Theater, you're just about to start the next season yeah, we, we actually had one production already, The Tragic Ecstasy of Girlhood by okay. Kira Rockwell. And, and this next week, on December 6th, we open Laura Neal's Winter People. Uh, so I'm very excited. We're in the middle of the season and about to go into the holidays, and everybody come and see it. Wonderful. Now, our future play today is Cleanliness, Godliness, and Madness, A User's Guide by Charlotte Behan. When I asked you to nominate a playwright to feature on the podcast, you immediately thought of Charlotte. I did. So what do you think we should know about this play that we're about to hear an excerpt of? Fortunately and unfortunately, it's timely. I think she began writing it some, you know, seven years ago, maybe, but was produced two years ago, and it still still makes me laugh, and it still makes me cry, and mostly at the same time, because it's so relevant to what our country our entire country is going through. The themes are, you know, racism, prejudice, religious extremity, but underneath everything is the hypocrisy of our lives and the people that we're dealing with. So I think very highly of it. It's an hilarious and, you know, somewhat experimental in that it uses projections Mm -hmm. to convey meaning, a film as well, and it's a spectacular piece, just period. You'll hear some mentions of visuals on the screens in the background during the play. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Cleanliness, Godliness, and Madness, A User's Guide. A multimedia, tragicomic play dealing with this godforsaken country. Grace, a Christian housewife slash mother in her late 40s. Mary, a Christian housewife in her late 30s. Fall 2016. Also, the continuous now, as this story will likely be relevant for a while. Place. Ohio, maybe. Connecticut. Upstate New York. Alabama. Michigan. West Virginia. Almost anywhere in this insane country of ours. Scene 1. Mary and Grace in what seems to be a home, though there's little reason you would know that. Maybe a clock on the wall. At rise, mid-conversation. Where do we start? Flyers. 
We'll flyer up every parking lot from here to Toledo. What do we call it? <laughs> the movement to restore decency, and for short, motor read. That's brilliant. Just brilliant. You are so smart. Well, it's what we're doing, isn't it? Bringing decency back to this country. Let's drink to it. Grace takes a flask out of her purse, opens it, and takes a swig of whiskey. She then hands it to Mary, who also takes a swig. This is scary. Take another swig. We'll be fine. Mary takes another swig. Cripes, Grace, we're doing this. Of course we are. Don't you want our kids—I mean, your future kids—to be proud of us? To wake up one day in years to come and say, "My mom saved the country from some really bad people." Yes, I do. Mary takes another swig. For Christ's sake, Mary, don't be so nervous. We can do this. Yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. Now you should know that is not the slogan for us, dear. I just. Oh, I forgot. Harry doesn't let you watch TV, does he? He says I get too enervated from it. And then it's full of disgraceful garbage. He keeps one under lock and key in the basement and goes down there in the middle of the night just so he can stay on top of the news. The news, huh? Yes, the news. Men are such pigs. Harry's not a pig. Harry's a good, honest man. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke, and he doesn't fool around. Is that so? As a matter of fact, it is. Do you think I would marry a bum? I didn't come from nothing. You know nothing. What is that supposed to mean? I was well brought up, <sighs> Mary. We're getting distracted. Let's pray, okay? I'm sorry for what I said. Thank you, Grace. God bless you. God bless you too, Mary. Now let's kick some ass, Grace. <laughs> Lord God, forgive me. Grace pulls a whip out of her pocket and beats herself on the back with it. Mary gets down on her knees and scrubs the floor. Grace, do you ever lose faith? <laughs> Don't let those words slip from your mouth again. But Grace, I just—do you hear me, Mary? Not ever, never, ever, ever. You will go to hell in a bucket, and I can't have that. I need you here with me. It's just that sometimes, well, Harry. Sure, Harry's a pain in the ass, and that's your cross to bear. Do you think my dick is a picnic? I can tell you, he's not. Does Dick make you? Don't say the words, Mary. I know what you're talking about. You got to get that man under control. Do you hear me, Mary? How do you do that? Let me put it this way. Dick knows where his bread is buttered, and he's not gonna upset the apple cart. Do you understand? I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that. We have so much work to do. First thing is getting sex education out of the schools. It's a disgrace. Have you heard that they're making a third sex bathroom now? Even yes, for the degenerates who don't know whether they're male or female. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we, we are, are in, in trouble. trouble. Can, Can you, you believe, believe what, what has happened? happened? The, the government, government is running amok with heathens all around us. What, what is, is this, this world coming, coming to? What, what should, should we, we do? do? As their bodies become closer and they touch, a jolt of lightning between them. Can you give us a sign? A large rainbow appears on screen. Grace, what do you think heaven is? Cotton candy, ice cream, creme de menthe, and clouds. Wouldn't that be lovely? Lovely? I don't think so. It's our destiny. It's everything. It's our destiny. Everything. Got it. Sometimes I worry about you, Mary. Me too. But but why? You don't seem to have the Lord in you. Mary doesn't respond. You don't, do you? I think I do. I just don't know what it means. Oh, you would know. Believe me, you would know if the Lord was in you. What do you feel? The Lord gets right up in your loins, Mary. He's in all the way. That sounds sinful to me. The Word was made flesh. What do you think that means, Mary? It means you have a body, and your body is alive. 
The Lord is embodied within us. How is it that you don't know that, Mary? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What does that have to do with the Lord being inside you? Romans chapter eight verse seven. I learned my lessons well, Grace. We shouldn't even be thinking about our bodies. Never mind getting the Lord involved with them. Well, you know what? We are wasting time on this claptrap. Precious time when we should be out saving this country from hellfire, heathens, and ruin. It seems to me we need a better plan than papering parking lots. All I can tell you is my dick will tolerate this up to a point. Oh, what about his bread and butter? I thought you had that all taken care of. You know, you're really starting to get on my nerves. God help me. We're going into the unknown, and there's no two way about it. This is big, Grace. Bigger than the both of us, and that's something I do feel in my body. I've made the commitment, no matter what happens. Have you? I sure as hell have. Let's buy some guns. Yeah, let's get the guns. We're, We're gonna, gonna need, need some guns, guns for, for protection. protection. <laughs> Who are we protecting? The Lord and His gospel. Who else? Let's lie down and take a nap. I work better in my sleep. Where do we do that? Come with me. As scenes of mass shootings come up on the screens, Grace leads Mary around in a circle. Grace then pulls Mary towards her, takes her bag off her, and they remove each other's belts. Grace unbuttons Mary's sweater, pulls off her own, and they fondle each other, moving into the simulation of sex, all as the scenes of mass shootings continue. After the sex, Mary rolls over and casually spreads her arms. Grace, Harry says he's not going to let me come over here anymore if I don't start tidying up. Oh, your house is spotless. Well, yes, cleanliness is next to godliness. I know that. It's the papers I can't get rid of. What papers? I have a hard time throwing mail out. Oh, isn't most of it junk? I look at it and think someone out there thought he was doing God's work by. Sending this to me? Oh,、no, he didn't. It was just some dirty little immigrant getting paid under the table to promote some other amoral idiot's garbage idea.、Oh, Grace, that is not very Christian of you. And you sound like a goddamn sappy liberal. <gasps> don't say goddamn, Grace. You know I don't like swearing. Oh, Lord, <laughs> forgive me. I've got to learn to curb my temper. <laughs> well, you're not all wrong. The principal in high school told my parents I had liberal tendencies, so they kept me home and, and safe from sin. The colleges are full of Marxists and Jews, anyway. Yeah, that's what they said. I cried a lot. I really wanted to go to college.、Oh, what for? You know, the world of ideas.、Oh, what nonsense! Oh, Grace. At least I didn't say what I wanted to say. What did you want to say? Never mind. No, really. What?、Uh, most ideas are overrated. Faith is what matters. Yes, faith. I always thought ideas would lead to faith, or at least hope. Oh no, ideas pave the way to hell. Why? Don't you know that most of the famous ideas of our time come from atheists? Oh, good gracious, that's terrible! They think they're smarter than God, or they can outfox God, but they can't. They're all burning in hell. I can promise you that, Mary. Well, you're probably right. I'm definitely right. That's the thing about us, Mary. We're not confused. These so-called intellectuals are a mess. I must admit, I get confused. Very confused, but you always bring me back, Grace. Where are we anyway? Right where we ought to be, doing the Lord's work. Now, it's time for a little cocktail, don't you think? Oh yes, I do. Tom Collins. A Tom Collins would sound divine. <laughs> oh, look at you, you fancy thing! Twirl around for me, will you? Oh no, I couldn't. Yes, you can. You can be proud of you. You're only doing it for me. There's no harm in that. Are you sure? I've asked the Lord myself, and He said it is righteous to take pride in one's appearance, just not to be too proud. How will I know the difference?
Our featured playwright today is Charlotte Meehan. She is the artistic director of Sleeping Weasel Productions since 2012. Sleeping Weasel presents bold experimental multimedia theater with social justice ideals. She's also currently the playwright in residence at Wheaton College. Please welcome to the podcast, Charlotte Meehan. Hi, Greg. Hi, Kate. Hi, Good to see you both. <laughs> in the play excerpt we just heard, we see a pair of housewives who are friends. They present themselves as right-wing political activists and submissives of wives, while later on in the play they carry on an affair that would certainly not be approved by their community. It was produced in the months just before the 2016 election. And how was that received in general? It's funny. I mean, at the time, I think some people probably thought it was too far out and and perhaps surprised. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think there was a real comfort, particularly in the East Coast, that this was far from our future and that Hillary Clinton would win the election. Mm -hmm. And I myself had hoped and really thought that the play would be irrelevant the day after the, le the election or far less relevant and... I went ahead and wrote it anyway because I, I suppose unconsciously I felt that I needed to make a warning to write a play that was a warning, which looking back, I feel the grandiosity of that. But at the same time, because I grew up on the far right, I understand that there are still many people out there like Mary and Grace. My mother was one of them. <laughs> and the play is very much based on a, her and a friend of hers who in the late 60s started the movement to restore decency. Wow. I didn't know there was such a personal connection there. Yeah. yeah. It's just that they didn't have an affair with each other. Her friend took off and had an affair with the chief of police of the <laughs> police department. <laughs> And, While still espousing, you know, family values. And well, values. yes, yeah. and <laughs> left her family for him. So that, of course, broke up the friendship. And my mother continued on with Motorweed, where she drove around town, literally, with a giant paper mache replica of a police cap on top of her station wagon, with bumper stickers all over the car that said, support your local police and keep them independent. Wow. Her friend supported one of those local police <laughs> in a different way. In more ways than one. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of times you encounter something you think is too far out, and then you delve in. It's actually you know, literally based in real uh, events. It's always odd when that happens. Yes. Yes. Odd. <laughs> <laughs> and very, I have to say, very personally disappointing for me, because I grew up on the fringe and we were not even allowed to talk about my father's activities in the John Birch Society out in public. And yet, that very, I don't know what to call it, political platform has become absolutely mainstream in our culture now, along with all the hypocrisy and lies that it comes with. And so, for me and my siblings, the election, if that's what we want to call it, of Donald Trump was a huge personal shock and trauma for us because it replicated what we grew up in that we thought we had escaped to the mainstream culture. Yes, right. Yeah, it was very problematic and traumatic. Uh, many students, I had like three students come into my office weeping after the election and said, I don't know what we're going to do. How will we get through this? You know, what, what will happen? And uh, I, I said, the only thing I could say is that um, my hope is that the pendulum will swing back, that I've lived long enough to know that that's possible, and we will, we will maintain, we will continue. But And we're recording in the aftermath of the 2018 elections, and we are. the pendulum has swung at well, least a little bit. Tiny, tiny, tiny bit. bit, but yeah. better than... Yeah. Better than not. Better than not, yeah. yeah. Has the play ever been produced in more red districts? The play has only had that one production. As a producer myself, I will admit I don't spend enough time promoting my own plays. And I have to say, too, that I was very heartbroken over the election and just wanted to move away from this play. I feel that now I'm ready to perhaps send it out again. You should. And be more More people proactive. want to do it. Yeah. yeah. It, I think it's now. Now. You know, now yeah. that we, we're, we're in it. Yes. We can see the humor and and the depth uh yeah it's it's a scary play scary and wonderful i you know i always want to know because you're a playwright and you're a, an artistic director but i always want to know what is 
you grew up in a in a right wing family. Where did you grow up? Well, we moved a lot. My mm -hmm. father was an engineer, but it was always in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Okay. Wow. So I was born in Connecticut. So you were in this bubble. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Amazing. And we eventually, by the time I got to high school, we moved to Long Island. Uh huh. And I went to a pre-Vatican II Catholic school. Wow. With myself and two boys in my class there, and it was horrifying. Yeah. It really was. What is your first memory of theater? Your very first memory. So here's the contradiction. My mother took us to the theater. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my mother loved the theater. So people are very complicated. Yes, they are. And they give you mixed messages that they don't know they're giving you. Yeah. <laughs> my mother took me to see Mum and Shots. Oh, when wonderful. I was 14. Oh my gosh. Yeah, my mother took us to I remember Mama. We went to see Gemini. We, I went to lots of plays, right, right? And then I started to go to plays by myself in high school. I took the train in by myself. And then by the time I think I was very early in college, my mother took me to see Agnes of God. Wow. But said, <laughs> I really resent that Mary, that Elizabeth Hurley said that Mary's not a virgin. <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, why would you take me to Agnes of God? <laughs> You know? Good, good. <laughs> so you think you you think you're being brought up one way and that's all true. Yeah. You know, that we were completely cloistered, but my mother almost sneaked us into the theater. Wow. Do do you think that's why you're in the theater? I mean, what drew you to make it a profession? Well, I think yes that she did introduce me to the theater. But she introduced me to the theater by driving around with a cop hat on top of her car. I was living in the theater in my house. It was a surrealist play. They had film showings every night, John Birch Society film showings in our home. There was a constant stream of crazy people coming in and out of my house. That was not like real life well so you're writing which is uh you know i i i wrote i wrote uh, down what i thought your writing was and so forgive me do it but i said i i said it was a cross between mac wellman and ionesco with some sam beckett thrown in for good measure <laughs> <laughs> and you call yourself abstract and expressionistic but there's so much specificity yeah. in what you write and it seems to me, hearing you talk, that maybe you're just writing reality in your childhood. I say that all the time. To others, my plays appear surreal, but to me, they are kitchen sink realism. <laughs> 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 but I will say, growing up that way makes you live somewhere between the earth and the sky. Yeah, You're always floating above the ground because the unpredictability of my father's temper took me outside of real time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, in fact, if I grew up differently, maybe I would be a classical, well-made right, right. playwright. Which you understand perfectly, or, I or do. Aristotle. But, yeah. but Yeah, I do. But it's, it's sort of, there was so much interruption to my psychological states mm -hmm. that I think my plays show that a lot. There's a lot of quick, quick change of mood. Yes. And yes. even like you say you cry and laugh at the same yes. time, it's because the mood is multiple, even in a moment yes. of time. Yes, I Even agree. in a line, the right. mood is mul multiple. I, I find, too, that you may not realize it, but I think you're also dealing with language, which is sort of juxtaposed against a somewhat, you know, it feels like a traumatic memory yeah. sometimes that you go so deep, it's, it's like, oh, I've been there, but I can't define it. The trauma is always there, whether it's whether we're laughing or, you know, shocked or whatever. I, I'm really glad you said that because, you know, the German theorist Hans Thiemann came up with the post-dramatic theater. Yes. I call my theater post-traumatic theater. <laughs> yes. But it has something in common with the post-dramatic in the sense that linearity doesn't really make sense to people who've been traumatized. Mm -hmm. So I like the classical arc because I want to give the audience something to hang their hats on narratively. Right. But then within that, there's so much interruption in my plays. Yes, that that stop that linear line and take us someplace else and then go back. Yes. Yeah. 
it's a it's a wonderful technique that you've managed to show us. It's a, I I personally love it. You you have a classical background. You you have degrees in playwriting from Brown and also Brooklyn College. I do, but my re, what I consider my background mm-hmm. is my degrees in French and comparative literature undergrad. Really? Uh huh. Because I think that's what. I think the French literature influenced me so much in my aesthetics. How so? Because the French are philosophical. Yeah. And I do think my plays, above all, I hope anyway, are philosophical. Well, you're saying something important to us. You're asking a really important question and asking us to think about it, too. The, the philosophy. Yeah, the, phil- the philosophy you know, part. The morality, is, yes, really, yes. Is, is everything. For me, it is. And it's about the idea of who are you? And who do you want to be? Mm-hmm. I think I'm always asking that. Who yeah. do we want to be? What are we? Yeah, what's possible? Yeah, what is civilization? Yeah. Can we have it? I think I'm asking that. So I think that's the French part. And, we're all you asking know, that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all asking that. That's right, Greg. I yeah. think we are. And my first language is French, too. Oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, my mother's French-Canadian. And so I think... That in some ways I write English and French. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Mm. You know. Hence the Beckett. Yeah, hence the Beckett. <laughs> yeah. So I think that circling back to what you're asking about how this all happens, you know how it's many years later you realize what kind of a writer you are? Yeah. I'm I'm I've been writing now for thirty years. I can only kind of sort of see now what it looks like uh-huh. that I do. You know, in other words, when you said your technique, I was thinking boy, my technique, it's kind of just what I do, naturally. It's an instinct. Yeah, but you do have a technique, but you don't always think about it that way. No, and you can't when you're writing. Right. You can't, you you know, be that intellectual about it. Right. Because everything that I've seen of yours or read of yours has been so instinctive, so emotional, really, rather than intellectual. On, On the other hand, I step back and I realize... Oh my gosh, you're saying some really important things to me that are intellectual. I am, but I also realize that I want and I believe in and I love plays that are emotional. Yeah, yeah. That's what I... That's what we go to the theater for. Yes, yes. So I think I am, above all, coming from my emotions. Right. Even though ideas are something I... Um. Like when Mary says, the world of ideas, <laughs> and feels she feels so romantic about that. I, I feel that, too. Yes. <laughs> I do. I want to go back to the story of your mom taking you to the theater so often. How often did she take you to the theater and then leave the theater being angry at the play? Well, often it was rare that she would take me to something that would truly go away from her own. I mean, Gemini, do you remember Gemini? It's so I do. funny. Yes, very funny. Philadelphia family, I yes. think, South Philadelphia. Yes. She could deal with that, kind of, because it was funny, mm-hmm. but it was definitely outre for her. But Agnes of God was way, way off the chart. So she would take us to musicals. I then, you see, what happened was I took up my own interest. And I would sneak into the city and go see the plays that I wanted to see. And strangely enough, Hugh Leonard's Daw had a big impact on me. Because the whole play happens in reverse, and the father is dead. Yes, I remember Through the whole play. play. And what I loved, who cares what I think about the play anymore? I don't want to know because I always want to love it my whole right, life. Right. Because what I loved is you could bring back the dead. Oh, yes. That was exciting. Yeah. And I couldn't move after the play. I was there with my sister, my older sister, and I I couldn't move. And she said, what is wrong with you? I said, I can't move. And she said, you are the weirdest person I've ever met. (laughs) (laughs) But I just wanted to be a playwright. It affected you. Yes. Yeah. Your sister didn't turn into a playwright. <laughs> no, she. But she's awesome. I mean, she runs hospice care units in hospitals. You know, she's she's another kind of person. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, can we talk about writing with multimedia in mind? Because this is definitely yeah. has. You you run your own theater, and then you know how to stage it, so you can know what production elements you are capable of. Yeah, this started really in <clears throat> two thousand. Well, it started in 2001 with my late husband, David Hopkins. And in fact, it was when G.W. Bush, we'll say, took the election. David had made these five animated films in the 80s during the Reagan-Thatcher era called Sweet Disaster. And they were all surreal 
imaginings of the end of the world. And we suddenly realized we just had our baby, Margot. We realized, oh my God, your films are totally relevant again. And we decided to make a theater piece that would incorporate snippets of the films within it. Then, of course, he was diagnosed a year later with terminal cancer and died. But we got so excited because we're crazy artists when he got cancer that we were going to also put his pathology reports into the play. (laughs) And we were going to put all the screens of his abdomen and the (laughs) cancer in the play. We were just trying to stay alive, I think, now. But then mixed into this whole mess, 9-11 happened. And we lived in downtown, 10 blocks away. He was sick. It took me until after he died in 2004 to go back to the play. And then I had to finish it. And it became a multimedia event in talking cure situations of various kinds, wherein his films interacted with the situation of this play, which was a completely abstract set where people's heads would pop out from the floor at times, Mm -hmm. or they would be, you know, on these different levels of playing, and the audience was facing each other. The audience was like like a cacophony. It was. It was a cacophony. And that's how the multimedia started. And then I realized we are completely bombarded with it every day, so I'm going to bring it into the stage. Rather than for me, in my aesthetic, have the stage be a separate place, I decided I wanted to go be more immersive and to subtextualize so many things that are coming at us every day in a variety of ways. So Kate knows my work. You know that I do that. Yeah. I'm often using commercials and yes. splashing them in yeah. to make a comment. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in you starting Sleeping Weasel because I, I'm just going to read what I got from your website, which says it's a bold, experimental work with social justice ideals. And you have sort of earned a real niche in the Boston theater scene for that very thing. But the header says, Making Different Possible, which I love. And it seems to me this is what the multimedia is is part of that. So what does that all sort of mean to you? And why did why did you start Sleeping Weasel? When well, and why? Again, Sleeping Weasel goes back to 1998 with my late husband David Hawkins, mm-hmm. who founded it in in England. So he called it Sleeping. He Weasel He called there. it Sleeping uh-huh. Weasel there, and we started to collaborate together both in Bristol in the UK and in New York City, and we. We did one of my plays at Dixon Place in New York. We did another one of my plays in in Bristol at at Alma Theater. And he also was very multimedia. He was an experimental filmmaker. And he was trying to start a web magazine for us. And all these things were going on at the time that he got sick. So Sleeping Weasel, I kept the name and just relaunched it here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he's on the website as part of the history of the of the company and he's always there with me yeah you know he's i keep his spirit alive and everything we're doing in all these different ways using music and dance and theater we do in that same spirit of his web magazine but in three dimensions on the stage Uh and sounds like a meeting of minds it's a meeting of minds and then howard wiseman one of our board members actually veronica anastasio wiseman's husband he came up with making different possible he's an amazing marketing executive and he has his own company and he was listening to me talk one day and he put the words together that's wonderful and he came up with it and it it's exactly what we want to do it's succinct and it says it yeah really great yeah, and, and in terms of the social justice ideals, we very much believe not only in the inclusivity of the artists, but also in being not just bystanders, but upstanders. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why last year we put on James Scruggs' Three Fips Trapped in a Traveling Minstrel Show, because we wanted to take a knee with him. Right, an Elliot Norton Award winner, by the it way. It was, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But it's also why we work with you, Kate, and we've produced and commissioned two of your plays, mm-hmm. The Tempest or Bark's Dream and The Last Bark, because your plays have a kind of, again, I think a philosophical, apocalyptic approach, mm-hmm. wherein I also feel by the end you are longing for life and existence oh. and civilization. Oh, you're so kind. So you... You bring us the big ideas, the high emotions, the story. You are an amazing storyteller. And so 
in those particular works of yours, the experimental part of it, was how you were really blasting open what a story means, I thought. Good, I'll go with that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) But I think what's so important about that is we're all asking ourselves right now what stories mean because we're constantly being disrupted. Yeah. And it, 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 it's, it's hourly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not just who's in office, although that's happening constantly because of the maniac running the country, but those plays we did of yours, we did before that election. And that, for me, that bombardment is part of late capitalism itself. And this idea that we are constantly being seduced into meaninglessness. Yes. And you are constantly looking for meaning. Right. And those are the kind of playwrights like you, Kate Snodgrass, I want to support and I want to promote and I want to produce. Then to that end, can you talk about audacity? The audacity. Yes, the audacity women speak. Again, now this did come out of what happened, really what's been happening since the whole Harvey Weinstein story broke last year. And then on and on and on, more of these men have been coming out and being called out for their behavior. But then again, we have a president who is insulting and assaulting the public every day with his tweets. And we decided we want to do a multi-vocal piece. This cannot just be one woman's voice speaking for all. We invited you, we invited Robbie McCauley, Holly Hughes, many, many others to bring out into the fore their stories because sadly we all have them. And it's not just about sexual assault, though that will be included in the piece. It's about everyday what we call microaggressions. And I understand that term, but add them all up and they're pretty macro. You say on the website again, systemic misogyny. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and I think you're doing it right now. But. Yes, but to be more overt yeah. about it, it's just there are ways that we are giving messages to ourselves as women. The whole culture is constantly bombarding us with the perfect bodies that are airbrushed. All all the ways women's bodies are talked about in TV commercials about being fresher and cleaner and all these things make it seem that women are naturally something to be tidied up and tightened up and constricted and at the same time often even that women brought in the broadcast news are putting themselves down it's unbelievable if you're really watching and listening awake and alive how many messages we're getting daily hourly it just listen to what's his name maddie in the morning is the most misogynistic radio host i have ever seen i've never heard it oh dear and it's because i'm in the car listening to the pop music with my kids and i listen to what this guy says about women and the homophobia is outrageous and so nonchalant yes coming out right systemic systemic right so 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 we just clarify the the audacity is an event that's coming up it is and it's a multimedia multi-vocal performance piece directed by Amelia Ben Susan. Kate is participating in it as well. And it's it's going to be an interaction between women's stories on stage performed by three women. Some women who have written pieces also will be on screens and then a whole lot of media. And it will be mostly found footage aside from the women who have contributed who will be on screen. It'll be found footage from the news to commercials to everything going on in our culture now and the treatment of women. Yeah, Yeah. to say, look at this, it is systemic. Yes. Yeah. And it's current. How are you going to put this all together? Well, I'm doing it as we speak. (laughs) I I have two assistants now working on collecting the video parts. Mm -hmm. I'm collecting the monologues and the, or snippets or fragments, whatever people want to do. Mine is a fragment. And then we're going to create a classical arc, really, yes. within a bombardment of imagery right. and dialogue. It's going to be wonderful. You'll so be helping me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. So your assistants are there, their assignments just to watch TV and just clip out any uh, casual instances they find of misogyny? Pretty much. Wow. And it's all up to them. I'm leaving it all up to them, and I'm going to sift through a lot. I already have quite a bit of material, but I'll be getting a lot more. Where are you doing this, and when... At the BCA in Martin Hall, Mm -hmm. where Three Fifths was, Uh and it'll be opening on March 28th and run to Mm -hmm. April 6th. Great. So good. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm excited. It feels good to be doing this. What do you think theater's job is now? 
Well, I can only say that theater itself gives itself so many different jobs, yeah. and part of it is really entertaining. And I think I think that's there's room a, for all of it. There's room for all yeah, of it, and God. and as far as the kind of theater I want to see mm-hmm. and I want to bring my students to see, I want them. I want to see works that make me feel more awake and alive, both to beauty and problems. Mm-hmm. I do believe in beauty as an antidote. I really do, but I also. I love the Greek tragedies, and I do want to be dragged through the mud. Yes, <laughs> as both. long as it's not gratuitous. Yeah. If it's if I'm bring, being dragged through the mud, it's because I want something to make me feel more about alive. yes, more alive, and more about what I should be thinking about. Mm-hmm. I want to be thinking and feeling to solve. Yeah. 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 I agree. So. Uh... Sleeping Weasel, you also produce other people's works. Um, How do you choose uh, types of works or or people to work with? Yeah, we really don't accept unsolicited submissions because we work with a core of affiliated artists, and that's how we set up the company, that we wanted to create a landscape of art, Adara Myers and myself, she's my producing partner, that really reflects an extension of our own aesthetics. And we just knew that we're very limited in resources and we really want to support this group of artists and so that's how we run the company and that's how it's sustainable for us Mm -hmm. and we try to stay local james scruggs is a new york artist i've known for a long time and i've wanted to bring his work to boston for a long time so he's an exception but not really because he's already one of my Yes, playwrights. I, I've, I've been corresponding and bringing his work to Wheaton College since two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's a it's a pretty tight knit group of us. Ken as well. Ken Just Preston and Z, amazing Tim playwright. Buck two. Um, yeah, Tim Buck too. Robbie Just was done here. Robbie McCauley, yeah. who I'm very close to, has directed my work and I produced two of her pieces as well. We just keep trying to grow and help each other grow. Mm-hmm. That's our ethos, isn't it? Yeah. Do you find the reception for your type of work in Boston to be getting better and better? or We've been incredibly lucky. We, I think we've yeah. been incredibly lucky. We have had critical response that has just been so intelligent in this city. And just, I, honestly, I've been amazed and humbled by the critical response we've received. Audiences, of course, we always want more people to know about Sleeping Weasel. But I think every theater in town, no matter how small or large is always wanting to draw more people to right, us, right. you know. But I feel blessed to be in Boston. I do. Oh, good. Yeah. It's good. We're blessed to have you. <laughs> so one thing I hope that happens is that people who listen to this podcast will actually want to inquire to the playwright for whatever reason. You know, what is the phone call that you'd most like to get from someone listening to the podcast? Oh, boy. I would love for... Okay, fantasy phone call. Fantasy phone I call. I would love to hear someone call me and say... What you're doing is really exciting, and I want to read this, that, and the other work, not only mine, but other of my affiliated artists' work, and I would love to um, come and see your work, and I would love to get involved. That would make me thrilled. Me too. (laughs) Charlotte and Kate, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Greg. This is fun. Thanks so much for having us. This has been wonderful. It was a pleasure to hear your work. And to everyone listening, support new plays and support local playwrights. Cleanliness, Godliness, and Madness, A User's Guide, was written by Charlotte Meehan. Grace was played by Veronica Anastasio Wiseman. Mary was played by Stephanie Burlington Daniels. Stage directions were read by Charlotte Meehan. Recorded at Boston Playwrights Theater. Follow us on Twitter at Boss Podplay and on Facebook. Please rate us on iTunes or your podcast player of choice. You can support us on Patreon at Boss Pod Play. Our theme was composed by Thomas Deus, thomasdeusmusic.com. Additional music by bensound.com. Other than yourself, do you know of a Boston area playwright who you'd like to be featured on the show? Let us know at bosspodplay at gmail.com.